Hey guys, Surfbone here, and today we're going to be covering a topic I think needs to be covered due to the quality, or rather lack thereof, when it comes to new interpretations, or as the kids call them, scales, that I see being put out. So I'd like to cover how to properly research a verse and or character in an effort to scale them. For some people, the response to this proposition is, Well, I know how to research. I can scale a cold steel to roll ventilators into your mother's ass. And to that I say, cringe. But in all seriousness, even if you consider yourself an expert, I implore you to keep watching because there might be something you've never considered. So when researching for the zeroth time, what we have to do is determine what we are looking into. Now, as a word of advice, looking into something as large as, say, Warhammer, DC, Marvel, or even D&D would be like diving into the ocean without even hearing about swimming. So to avoid being overwhelmed by info or drowning, you should narrow your scope of what you need to look into. I understand why people want to dive on in and just get all that juicy hickory flavor. Wait, that's barbecue sauce. Anyways, I understand that you want to be the sentient galaxy brain meme about your given verse because, hey, cosmology and the magic system could make this random feat way more impressive. But you can always just note down these feats and statements to evaluate later once you truly get your bearings. Another word of advice for people who are listening in and thinking, well, if cosmology recontextualizes feats, then maybe I should read it into the cosmology first. This is also a sort of trap, as to someone who doesn't know anything about DC, a Batgirl comic is just as likely to contain cosmology statements as, say, Green Lantern. So instead of just learning the cosmology or just one character, we go in first generally learning the verse. Then, upon another reread or rewatch, we can then use this knowledge to help us find what we're even looking for in the first place. Once we have gotten this general knowledge of who's who and what's what, we can then make an informed decision and select what are we looking into. This style of research allows us to find information much more efficiently than the guess and check that would just be diving into something random. For smaller verses like basically anything in Shonen Jump, I'd say just start at chapter 1 and go forward. Obviously there could be supplementary material, but that's a topic we'll be covering later on in this video. So now that we have our topic and this rough idea of how to look into the aforementioned topic, we can now go over what sources are we going to use. Just like before, picking sources is something we should make an informed decision on, not pick first and justify later. So let's say, for example, we're going into look into Naruto. What should we do or read if we want to learn about Naruto? A. Random magazines. B. Fandom websites. Or C. The Naruto manga. Obviously the answer is C, right? If you picked anything but C, I don't really know what to tell you. Alright, well, when we look for our research materials, we find out that there are different versions of the manga. We have the version that was only printed in the Weekly Shonen Jump, and the finalized volumes. Which one do we pick? Again, the whole lesson of this video is informed decisions. And when we look into it, it turns out a majority of manga authors like Kishimoto don't really consider the weekly release to be the true version of the story, and will in fact revise their work for the volumes. Along with this, Shonen Jump themselves will include things in the manga that solely exist to sell more manga, and isn't even a part of the manuscript the mangaka hands off every week. So with this information in mind, we should probably read the volume release of the manga first. For some other verses, the topic of which canon to use is a very heated discussion topic. And to that I can say, just pick the safest option. For our Naruto example, just read the core manga. And don't start by trying to argue that the store games are canon or the movies are canon to the manga or something like that, unless you're willing to deal with the amount of baggage a claim like that brings. So we have our topic and how we're going to initially look into said topic. Great! But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Most verses have supplemental media of some kind that we can look into as well. And when it comes to supplemental media, it's very much a case-by-case -case basis in regards to how we should engage with it and whether or not they apply. 
there aren't many statements anyone can make universally about what makes something a source, but there are some general guidelines we can go by. So in most cases, the original material, be it the manga, movie, or games, trumps adaptation that proceeds after it. So the anime of Naruto does not override the manga that it's based on. That being said, I think there's something we need to go over momentarily that is the ambiguity fallacy, which is where you take a word or phrase that has multiple definitions and is ambiguous, come to the conclusion first on which one is being used, then make an argument based on the interpretation of the word that the other person doesn't inherently mean. So for example, if we're going to debate Naruto, trying to use the anime because, well, it's Naruto, would be such a fallacy. This is relevant because you aren't required to look into every possible aspect of a property, especially when they end up being multiple continuities and form interpretations for each one. I think this idea also applies to guidebooks, in the sense that I don't think you have to include guidebooks in arguments. They generally don't trump what's in the primary source. Now when I say that, I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of different ideas about what a guidebook even is. And honestly, I think that is due in part to Dragon Ball fans. And what they would do, and still do, is call every piece of supplemental material a guide, as a way to borrow the cred credibility of Dragon Ball's actual guidebooks like the Daizenju and Chozenju. A page advertising the anime? That's a guide. An RPG rulebook written by some dude in the US? Clearly a guide. A sticker book only published in one part of the world? Well, that's obviously the highest form of information for Dragon Ball, dude. Now, I'm sure I've offended all the five regressive Dragon Ball fans who still hate watch me, but whatever. Fundamentally, a guidebook should be this material published with the sole purpose of explaining the work in question, since a series can't always go into super discreet detail about every technique, ability, and or cosmological structure without sacrificing the pacing. Now we have covered adaptations and guidebooks, but now there's another type of source that people use that in my opinion may come as a shock to some who don't know me, author statements, I'm ripping the band-aid off they aren't a source. There are plenty of resources as to why they aren't, but the root of it is, they just aren't in and are exclusively not part of the story. If we had Kishimoto make a statement that came from some interview, it's not in the story of Naruto, but rather it's a statement about Naruto. Said statement has just as much validity as a statement made by literally anyone else. Some counter arguments will be like, but Kishimoto wrote Naruto. Well, why doesn't he write his statement into the manga then? You have to remember that Naruto itself can exist by itself and doesn't require Kishimoto to coexist along with it in order to be read and or interpreted. The same way you can conceive a child when it becomes an adult and it's now able to exist by itself. Another counter would be, Kishimoto knows more about Naruto. That right there is an ought to statement, not a has to statement. Sure, he ought to know a lot about the story, but he doesn't necessarily have to. But you know who does know a lot about Naruto? Nairobi. Not only that, but any take Naya has can be and often is supported with the manga. You know, like any take anyone would have. Key word being anyone. So this author statement even if they are a turbo nerd, still needs evidence to support it. Even then, at the end of the day, this statement would only be right by the same metric that any interpretation can be right, because it ends up circling back to citing the source material to prove that this statement is correct. Who ends up making the correct statement, or the name attached to the statement, doesn't matter. To clarify, any Twitter statement you might have about why Godzilla from Hell is actually 1S goes in the trash since you're never able to prove it with the comic in question. Some more dishonest people argue that, Well, we can include all of those into Naruto because it's stamped with the Naruto branding. This falls into the ambiguity fallacy I mentioned earlier. Not only that glaring issue, but the question becomes why should it be a part of Naruto? 
this same problem is presented in the actual literature regarding death of the author. Should this random sticky note that says, I forgot my umbrella, be included in the complete works of Nietzsche? Should this Naruto branded soap be included as a source? It still baffles me to this day how often people cite the author to prove such claims to be true, despite the fact that the authors are just as fallible or capable of making mistakes as anyone else in the world. To claim an author's word has inherent value is to claim they are essentially omniscient gods incapable of being wrong. And even if that was true, we still have to interpret the author's words anyway. And what happens when we need to prove our statement is more likely correct? That's right, we have to circle back to the source material. At this point in our journey, we have picked out something to research, looked into it, figured out what to read and why, but what if we wanted to expand our horizons? Well, you always have the option to scale the less canon adaptations, maybe even document just how different the scaling would be. But in the event you're reading something much larger, you can look at other parts of the mythos. With DC, why not check out the magic side of the comics? With D&D, try to pick up a new setting to look into like Ravenloft or Dark Sun. With Warhammer, why not look into Age of Sigmar or Blood Bowl? Some people will often see scaling a big verse as claiming you know absolutely everything about it, and I don't think that's true either. If someone is like the expert on Green Lanterns, why should they know which Robin is the strongest with the same degree of certainty? Now don't get me wrong, this isn't to say that your Green Lantern stuff can't accommodate the Robins into it somehow, but having a very wide interpretation that can accommodate the entire verse will always be superior than trying to section off the verse where people will at worst claim that none of it is canon. In my experience, everyone who has tried to divide up verses into parts to say they aren't canon to each other end up with terrible interpretations even within their weird canonicity framework. The important thing to remember though, when you're expanding your horizons, is even if you want to use say non-canon movies and see how they work into your scaling, you can entertain this idea without actually thinking it's true. Or to simplify it, you don't have to believe it's canon to pretend like it is for a thought experiment. So no, you don't have to jump into the holy war of hell versus canon to talk about its scaling. Eventually, while expanding your horizons, you will reach the bleeding edge. The point where you are the singular person who has ever looked into what Hashi calls esoteric bullshit. For a lot of Shonen Jump series, like the Shonen Holy Trinity, my friends and I have often speculated that there are probably loads of promotional statements in Weekly Shonen Jump that no one has ever archived. Hell, if this was Dragon Ball, those would be called guides and be used for decades to justify some weird position. Another example would be that there might be some out of print magazines for your tabletop game that no one really ever read with the Researcher Sigma male grind set. Once you have crossed this bleeding edge of research, you are now influencing the grand scope of your selected topic. Ideally, whenever someone brings up the verse in the future, they will inevitably have to address your arguments one way or another. I'm sure you have a few in your head right now. Truly a goal all scalers strive for. However, there is another side of this where your argument is so terrible, people jokingly bring it up because of how bad it is. Hopefully, none of y'all end up as that one. Something I've conveniently saved in hopes people wouldn't have watched two minutes into the video, try this and say they've done research, is the idea of using secondhand information to supplement your research. Now there are quite a few problems you can run into when you at best just skim a respect thread to see what people commonly say. The first one is that oftentimes respect threads are influenced by the site they are posted on. Try to find dimensional tiering on classic comic find? A solid 90% of the time, you won't. Some sites will often dismiss anything that isn't some very literal and explicit big math boom as some kind of figurative language, be it a metaphor, simile, flowery language, what have you. The issue here is that just saying that isn't dismissing the possibility that it could be literally true as well. So for example, if something is as impossible as herding cats, 
That wouldn't mean it's magically possible because I used a figure of speech to show just how impossible it is. Another example would be in Warhammer, they often call the warp the great ocean and reference its depths. This is both a metaphor to understand the metaphysical nightmare hellscape and an accurate depiction since the warp does have a surface with tides and its crushing extroversal depths. Ultimately, like a lot of things in fiction, you just have to weigh what is more consistent and works within the verse. Another thing to note is that what you read in that thread can influence a bias. Say if you read a fight goes a certain way in that thread, that might influence how you read the rest of the work to justify some scaling chain you came up with on the fly. Ultimately, by looking at that thread, you're reading someone else's interpretation, which can lead to the next section if they so happen to fake or just misremember a scan. Another major pitfall would be following for woozles. For those who don't know, the woozle is this mythical creature that Winnie the Pooh and Piglet went looking for in the snow. They kept following and following the tracks and never found it. But when Christopher Robin showed up to help them, he came to find out that it turns out the tracks they were following were their own footprints, meaning the woozle never existed. It is with this story that the term the woozle effect was born. To make it clear, a woozle would be something that's just cited on threads or in debates, which cites another thread and on and on and ad infinitum. But there's never an actual scan at the end. But hey, there's gotta be something out there, right? I mean, look at how many threads cite it. Well, my young grasshopper, that's where you're wrong. As some of you will know, in this community, people will bite bullets, fake scans, talk about other subjects entirely, and bug authors on Twitter for the smallest pieces of proof or reasoning for their own stance. So when we lower the bar to your average window-licking text form user, you can only imagine the dishonesty they will go through to say that they're right. This effect is magnified when people are already fairly well read, will see some dumb regressive wiki has done a CRT on their subject, and then they just presuppose there's some basis to it, without actually fact-checking the thread or seeing where they cited this information from. My brother in Nika, a week ago you were talking about how stupid they are, and you've already read the series. Like, good lord, don't fall for such engagement traps. Rant aside, be it a fate statement or just rating of a character, you should not assign some validity to something just because you see it on a forum. Wait to see the evidence, and even then look into said evidence, to see if what is being claimed by that forum to be true. There are loads of fake scans and or faulty translations out there for just about any verse. So be very cautious of using anything you can't verify to some degree. I know after listening to this whole rant, someone's gonna say something like, Look at Surfbone saying all forms are wrong. Keyboard warriors assemble. We write at dawn assuming our moms. Let's go! Well, my basement dwelling critic, I'm not saying all forms are wrong, but rather to express caution on them specifically because forms are the main way you're going to find arguments to begin with. It's not like you can search all of Discord for something. It's not like I'm saying don't exercise caution when you find something in Discord. Hell, I have a whole video about the issue with scan servers, which you should totally watch if you, if you haven't. Anyways, now that I've quelled the anger of the seven people who absolutely love forums, let's talk about something else that's rampant on them. Obfuscation. So on forums, there's typically some sort of dogma like Superman can't be universal, he caps at solar system. And because of this, they won't even cover most universal feats and instead peel to some three they can even try to poke holes in. What this results in is a meta where you only ever see the same pieces of evidence trying to establish an idea, missing the forest for the trees. A thing people will often do, and this is more prevalent on space battles, is because on said site, they refuse to acknowledge anything higher than multiversal, as quote, and I'm not even joking, it requires less imagination than low-balling characters 
and doing military matchups where everyone's peak human. They just won't document those feats or statements thinking they're inherently wrong or something. Like, they have people who will read a story and post all the feats from it like a third day after it's out, but ignore cosmology statements for some evidence that this rocket can blow up a town. On Comic Vine, a very prevalent example of obfuscation will be how they will fight tooth and nail for the quote-unquote street tiers to remain, well, street tiers, i.e. Spider-Man and Batman can't just scale to powered up folks. Now, do they scale? I, Surfbone, don't know. That's a question for someone who's read all their appearances, but I sure as hell don't have this weird aversion to that idea. What you will also see people do is try to say certain statements are hyperbolic as a way to dismiss them. What people seem to forget is that this is a positive claim, and we need some kind of evidence to show it's hyperbolic. We can't just claim anything is hyperbolic baselessly. It should be a last resort for a statement that otherwise wouldn't make sense. This sort of reputation of, oh, it's just hyperbolic, is quite literally poison in the well. I'd like to go on and on more about how I feel about this, but I feel like I'd just be reiterating that it's poisoning the well to spread this thought germ that the Naruto guidebooks are all hyperbolic. Now, it's important to note that hyperbolic statements do in fact exist, as do metaphorical ones, and the mark of a good scaler is being able to distinguish between what should be a hyperbolic statement as dictated by context and what statements are just literal. There is another side to this discussion, and that is flowery language. In some very regressive circles, people will say that because a statement, usually in a novel, is quote unquote too flowery that we can't use it. I think this is a terrible way to look at writing. Just like with metaphors and similes, we should ask ourselves why is this statement true or false, and is it consistent? There is no real shortcut to this either, unfortunately. It's all shades of grey. There is no, like, smoking gun for every possible case to determine if something is literal. Every verse has a different consistent interpretation, and every statement has a million factors that we can look into, and to reject everything is just as lazy as to accept everything. A verse is like a sandbox. You have to build it up. Now sure, there is some kind of foundation at the bottom, but everything else is built via interpretation. We don't have some grand sand catalog to say that grain has to be sculpted into a castle. I know that's a hard pill to swallow, but there isn't some objective answer to everything.